Hello and welcome to another edition of Community Forum. My name is Joseph Feaster. I am the host of the program and I have a returning guest who is no stranger to Community Forum. Uh, my friend from across the pond, uh, the ambas former uh, ambassador to the United States for Israel, uh, former ambassador Yoram Ettinger. Uh, so hello ambassador. Hello, hello, and just a uh, certain correction. I was an ambassador in charge of congressional affairs at the Israeli embassy. I was not the ambassador. All right, well, in charge, and I was going to correct because I'm about to give your uh, introduction. You know, to me, uh, your ambassadorship was so impressive that in terms of fine, uh, you know, whoever was the PM at the prime minister at the time, certainly should have made you the ambassador, but we won't dwell upon history. We will go forward. Let me tell, remind our guests a little bit about, about you and then we can get into our discussion. Uh, ambassador Ettinger is an Israeli researcher, a diplomat, a writer, a lecturer, and consultant to Israeli and US legislative and staffers. Uh, he is an expert in US-Israeli relations Middle East Affairs and Jewish Arab Demography. From 1985 to 1988, he served as the Israeli, Israel's Council General in Texas and headed Israel, Israel's government press office. He, from 1989 to 1992, he was the Israeli ambassador in the US relations with the United States Congress. And he, as he does now, as I speak with him, he resides in Jerusalem with his lovely wife, Aura. He has three daughters. And, you know, I have a daughter, so I know how the girls uh, have uh, take, take uh, over us there, Ambassador. So, again, I want to welcome you to Community Forum. Thank you. It's my pleasure and my honor. We haven't had a conversation since uh, 2019. And, of course, COVID has been in, uh, uh, has interfered in a lot of ways and disrupted things across this, uh, across the planet uh, with regards to its impact. But there were changes in here. We, we didn't get a chance to talk during the previous administration about what was going on. So I would like to start with what is your area of expertise and for you to help our viewing audience to know exactly what you feel about US-Israeli Israeli relations that would have occurred during the Trump administration. And now as we begin the Biden administration, and I've read a lot of your material, so I have a sense, but I'd like for you to definitely tell our audience. Well, uh, one, one should realize that US-Israel relations are unique uh, in international relations, because when it comes to uh, US relations with the Jewish state, it did not start with the establishment of the Jewish state in 1948. It did not even start with the establishment of the United States in 1776. It started, in fact, uh, in the late 17th century with the arrival of the early pilgrims who considered themselves to be the uh, modern people uh, of uh, uh, the modern chosen uh, people. And they uh, looked at uh, Britain as modern day Egypt, and they looked at their destination as their modern day promised uh, land. And as a result, uh, you have in the US well over 1000 sites, uh, cities, towns, uh, small towns, villages, 
uh, mountains, national uh, parks, uh, deserts bearing biblical uh, names. And I mentioned that uh, element, which today, by the way, reflects itself uh, through the uh, appearance of uh, hundreds of uh, 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 statues of Moses and the Ten Commandments throughout the U.S., including in the halls of the Supreme Court and the U.S. Uh, uh, the, the Chamber of uh, House of Representatives. Uh, I mentioned that because to understand the special relations, you have to go back some 400 uh, years, which means the roots of the relations uh, transcend political arrangements, strategic arrangements, economic uh, arrangements, uh, certain political uh, campaigns. It has to do with uh, historical and uh, value uh, like uh, common denominator, which is very rare in uh, international relations. On top of that, whether it's uh, democratic or republican, uh, administration, whether it's left or right government in uh, Israel, uh, Israel uh, has been a unique strategic ally of the U.S. in the Middle East, extending the strategic arm of the U.S. without the need of a single American uh, soldier. Uh, we have mutual threats such as uh, international uh, terrorism. Uh, epicenters of that terrorism happen to be in the Middle East. They threaten Israel, but they also threaten Europe and uh, the US, in fact, the whole American uh, continent. Uh, there is the threat of the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran, which have been uh, a, a real and a present uh, existential threat to every single pro-American Arab regime, as well as uh, to Israel. Uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran have proliferated terrorism and drug trafficking all the way to uh, South America and Central America, creeping <clears throat> into the homeland of the United uh, States. And certainly, uh, we have collaborated pretty effectively in face in the face of such uh, threats. Uh, every single pro-American Arab regime considers Israel to be its most effective life insurance, and that has relieved the U.S. of uh, some uh, military commitments, which otherwise would have been rendered to spare the existence of those pro-American Arab regimes. And then we have obviously the joint uh, challenge of maintaining technological edge over the rest of the world, whether it has to do with medicine or agriculture or artificial uh, intelligence or uh, cyber uh, technology or uh, defense uh, industries the collaboration between the U.S. and Israel, and obviously the U.S. has always been the senior partner, but it has been a partnership, has created the leading technologies commercially and militarily in the world today. And just one example, we have in Israel well over 200 American high-tech giants uh, which maintain in Israel their research and development centers, sometimes a few such centers per each uh, American high-tech uh, giant. And that has rendered the U.S. a major, major edge in the international uh, competition, leveraging the brain power of, uh, of Israel. The bottom line is, that again, whether it's left or right, the Republicans or Democrats, the collaboration, the cooperation between the two countries has been a mutually beneficial two-way street, rendering the American taxpayer a very, very uh, substantial uh, rate of return on the annual American investment in Israel, which erroneously 
is referred to as foreign aid. It is not foreign aid. It is an American investment, which is very critical, very vital for Israel, but it produces a rate of return literally of a few hundred percent every single year. And I will sign off with one uh, example. A former uh, chief of the Air Force Intelligence uh, stated that in, for the US uh, to procure the scope of intelligence which, the, which it receives from Israel would require establishing five CIAs. As some of the viewers know, the budget of a single CIA is about $15 billion annually. The annual American investment in Israel, which is very generous investment for which we are grateful here in Israel is $3.8 billion. But that $3.8 billion produces a rate of return five, six, seven times the level of the investment and I've yet to provide examples from the defense industries of the US which benefit greatly from Israel which is the battle tested laboratory of the American defense uh, industry and there are many other examples and, and therefore while sometimes uh, as happens within uh, good families and among good friends. Sometimes we have disagreements and frictions, but the bottom line is that we're talking about the US-Israel Association, which has been a unique uh, bond uh, spiritually, culturally, uh, economically, medically, agriculturally, as well as militarily. Ambassador, you always make my job easy uh, because of the breadth of your knowledge of the history, the economics, the strategic relationships that exist not only with the United States, but around the world as you address some of the strategic position that Israel holds within the Middle East. So I do want to, you know, parse some of this out and to have you speak a little bit more directly on some of the issues which I know have been uh, here. And I do want to come back to Israeli-US relations during Trump and Israeli versus what you anticipate for the Biden administration. I've read some of your writings with regards to uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and what he proposes or has proposed because he's been in the administration previously. I want to talk about that. But let's set the stage as well since you so carefully trace the history. In previous programs, we've talked about the role of Great Britain in 1947 and how it, Israel established in the relationship and some of the things which, at least from my viewpoint, created some of the strife and that's going on in the Middle East because of what was done in 1947 with that divide. But nonetheless, let's talk about, I would like for you to give an update on the relationship with some of your I'll call them your neighbors. I've been to Israel. I went there with the late Lenny Zakum back in 1984. I traveled from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, you know, so I went from uh, east to west, uh, or you know, from west to east. And uh, I went up to the good fence up by Lebanon. I went down to Masada. So I was throughout the country. I didn't get all the way down to Egypt or Gaza. Uh, but and nonetheless, I traveled quite a bit and had a great experience, learned a lot while I was there. But I want to talk about Israeli relationships with Iran and now the discussion about the nuclear uh, arms deal. What's going on as far as your neighbor, Saudi Arabia? Uh, what is going on as far as uh, with, with Lebanon? And of course, the most recent situation, and this has had flare ups at various points in time, and I understand has been resumed, the the uh, the what has been going on in Gaza. So if you could just, in whatever order, how you want to talk about it in totality, take them separately, if you would speak to those, because I know that you have a great sense of all of that. Well, uh, when it comes to the recent uh, war, May of uh, 2021, the recent war against uh, Hamas terrorists in uh, Gaza, uh, one needs to take 
a broader view of that uh, war. The broader context highlights the fact that Hamas has been a proxy of the Ayatollahs in uh, Iran. Uh, moreover, uh, Hamas uh, is also a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood organization, which is the largest Sunni Islamic terror organization in the Middle East and beyond, uh, an organization which has been very skillful in establishing both terroristic as well as political and social uh, branches. Uh, but the aim of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is also the aim of Hamas, which is also the aim of the Ayatollahs of Iran, is to do away with the contemporary Arab or Muslim regimes and subordinate all these regimes and the rest of the world to a universal Islamic uh, society following the teachings of the Quran. Uh, and uh, Israel's war against Hamas terrorists in many respects, in many respects is the Western war against Islamic terrorism, which has plagued already Europe to a large extent, which has established footholds in South America, especially in the trilateral border of Argentina, Paraguay and Brazil in another trilateral border of uh, Chile and Peru and uh, Bolivia and uh, establishing pretty uh, uh, very positive, uh, very substantial relations between the Ayatollahs and Hezbollah uh, terrorists on the one hand and Venezuela on the other hand uh, creeping uh, well into Mexico, aiming aiming to reach the uh, U.S. Uh, itself. Israel's war against Hamas is, in fact, against that uh, larger context, the larger background, the Western uh, war for the Western own homeland uh, security. When it comes to uh, Iran or the Ayatollah's regime, in uh, Iran, we're talking about a regime which has been in place since the 1978-1979 revolution in Iran, which put an end to the pro-US Iran under the regime of the Shah, who was in fact the effective American policeman of the Persian Gulf and transformed Iran from the most important uh, pro-US strategic uh, ally into the most threatening uh, entity to the US in the Middle East and, uh, and beyond. The current uh, negotiation between the US and the Ayatollahs of Iran are based in my uh, humble opinion on series of flawed uh, assumptions. There's no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind that the intentions by the American policymakers are very, very noble, very, very uh, positive. Uh, the intentions to bring an end to conflicts in the Middle East and throughout the world to avert the wrath of uh, nuclear uh, Iran. But uh, noble intentions aside, the critical issue is, are those uh, intentions in line or out of line with the reality in Iran, in the Persian Gulf and throughout the Middle East? We're talking about uh, an assumption by the Washington policy makers that uh, Iran is uh, a country which could uh, uh, conduct peaceful coexistence with its Sunni Arab uh, neighbors. I wish it would be true, but this has not been the case. This has not been the case since the seventh century. We're talking about the Middle East, which is history uh, driven, Middle East with very, very long uh, memory. And in the Middle East, the saying goes, 
uh, people do not forgive and people do not forget whether the conflict is a recent conflict or goes back to the 7th or the 11th or the 15th uh, century. Uh, the first war between the Shiite Muslims, Iran for instance, and the Sunni Muslims, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Oman, for instance, the, uh, the first such war uh, took place, was triggered in the seventh century. The war still goes uh, on. It may sound strange to people in the West, but sadly, uh, in a frustrating manner, this has been, this still is the, the Middle East. The assumption that the Ayatollahs of Iran would be willing to share power with their Sunni Arab neighbors has to do with Pollyannish uh, expectations, Pollyannish uh, vision, nothing to do with the real Middle East, which has been very highly unpredictable, very uh, violently intolerant, uh, uh, extremely devoid of any sign of democracy, very uh, despotic, uh, 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 ruining human uh, rights. This has been the reality throughout the Arab world, so to speak, in the Middle East, throughout the, most of the Muslim world, even beyond the, the Middle East. Uh, the idea that a very generous, uh, tempting economic, financial, diplomatic package would convince the Ayatollahs of Iran to abandon their strategic uh, goal also has to do with uh, certain Western expectations which are divorced from the Iranian or the Middle East uh, reality because the Ayatollahs of Iran have been driven from day one when they took over in 78, 1979, it has never been driven by standard of living, by the level of education, by level of medicine. It has been driven mostly, almost totally by a fanatic religious imperialistic uh, vision to subordinate the entire Middle East and the rest of the world to the vision of Shiite is, uh, Islam. Uh, Can I just stop you for just one minute? Because sure. I just want to come back and revisit. And again, like I said, I always uh, sit in awe when I uh, have a program with you, uh, uh, Ambassador, because you know I learned so much. Granted, I've done my research, so I'm familiar with what you were talking about. But to hear it so succinctly uh, articulated, it's always helpful. But but I I, I want to for our viewing audience, I want them to understand a little bit more about the conflicts. Because again, I'm looking at the most recent kind of conflict. You call it the war with in the Gaza Strip. Started around May 10th, and uh, there was a ceasefire uh, that took place uh, uh, sometime in, uh, in in May. It lasted only a, it only lasted about eleven days, and then it resumed again in June. My sense is, as I look at uh, you know some of the information that I read, talked about. I mean, I don't understand why one would even initiate a battle uh, with Israel. It is because they they their destruction that took place in the Gaza Strip in comparison to what trans, uh, transpired in Israel is so dramatic. 18 buildings destroyed, uh, uh, their schools, some medical facilities in the, in the Gaza Strip, some of the high rises, the death toll uh, was, was, was dramatic in terms of uh, as far as 256 Palestinians, 13 Israelis, uh, during the 1900 uh, Palestinians injured, 200 uh, injured in Israel, you know, 72,000 displaced. And then the resumption of the fighting. What, I mean, wh what seems to drive that type of action? It almost seems suicidal to me that one will, because the launching of their missiles into Israel didn't start that <laughs> by at least what's been reported, didn't start that strike. What's going on? What's in the minds, uh, uh, as best, you know, granted, 
you cannot know what's in one's mind, but some of the demonstration of it just doesn't seem logical to me that you'd want to take on uh, an adversary of such power and might. The Iron Dome has, has, has been shown to be effective against any of the missile attacks. So if you could just put it in context as to what you think they may be thinking with regards to that, that would be helpful. Well, once again, in order to understand the conflict, the war between uh, Israel and Hamas uh, terrorists in Gaza, one must, in my mind, to go beyond the surgical examination of that particular May 2021 conflict or war. One needs to take a broader view, both historically as well as uh, strategically. It is common to assume that Palestinians are fighting Israel because Israel supposedly took over uh, areas uh, which belonged to the Palestinians in the 1967 uh, war. Uh, Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank and uh, Gaza and the Eastern part of uh, Jerusalem. Well, the reality is that the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the largest Palestinian terrorist group, which today controls the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, and before him Arafat, the PLO was established in 1964, three years before the 1967 war. And it was established with a charter calling for the liberation of Palestine. What was Palestine in 1964 when Israel did not establish it itself back in uh, the West Bank and in Gaza and in East Jerusalem? Well, it has to do with pre-67 uh, Israel. The largest organization within the PLO, again, headed by Mahmoud Abbas and before that by Arafat, is the Fatah organization. The Fatah organization was established in 1959, eight years before the 1967 war. And once again, until today, the, uh, the symbol of the seal of uh, Fatah, just like the seal of the PLO, uh, they have uh, the whole of the area from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean depicted as Palestine, no room for a Jewish state in the Middle East, according to the fundamentals of uh, the Palestinian uh, terrorists. But if we go further back into history, we found out that the initial stages of anti-Jewish terrorism in the land of Israel uh, were established back in the late 19th century. Uh, further on in the 1920th, uh, you, you had waves of terrorism, which in fact uh, uh, eliminated uh, a whole Jewish communities in the city of Hebron uh, and other parts of, uh, of the land of, uh, of Israel. Uh, the, the bottom line is that at the crux of the Palestinian conflict with Israel, there is no uh, uh, reference to the size of the Jewish state. It is the existence of the Jewish state, which is, has been targeted by Palestinian terrorists. And this is a combination of Palestinian nationalism, terrorism on one hand, and Islamic uh, doctrine on the other hand, namely, according to Islam, the world is divided into the abode of Islam and the abode of the infidel, which one day will have to succumb itself to Islam. The Middle East is part of the abode of Islam. And according to Islam, there is absolutely no right for a non-Muslim uh, entity to be sovereign in the abode of Islam. That's the reason, by the way, that they do not tolerate a Christian Lebanon in the Middle East. That's the reason that they do not tolerate any Christian minority in the Middle East. And that's the reason they do not tolerate a Jewish sovereign entity in the uh, Middle East. Uh, you didn't need any trigger 
for Hamas terrorism back in May of 2021. There has been terrorism going on on, on a routine basis uh, since the late uh, 19th uh, century. And once again, the goal is the extermination of, uh, of Israel. When it comes to the substantial losses to Palestinians during the recent war in Gaza, uh, this again requires a wider uh, context and the wider context has to do with the nature of uh, the Hamas regime in Gaza. The Hamas regime in Gaza, just like the Ayatollah regime in Iran, is not driven by higher education level for the Palestinians in Gaza, higher health uh, level, uh, more uh, better standard of uh, living, more on employment opportunities, uh, etc. What drives uh, Hamas terrorism, again, is the extermination, the intimidation of the Jewish entity, namely uh, Israel. And for that, they have taken hostage the entire civilian population of Palestinians in Gaza. The reason that there are so many losses to Palestinians is the fact that the Hamas has taken hostage civilians in Gaza by establishing, launching uh, positions of missiles fired at Israel in schoolyards, in civilian neighborhoods. In fact, you have major storages of Hamas missiles under schools, under hospitals, and that has been the tactic of uh, Hamas. This has been the tactic of Palestinian terrorism, again, for about 100, slightly over 100 years. And this has been also the tactic, again, of the Ayatollahs in Iran. You go back to the Iran-Iraq war, of the 1980s, uh, there were half a million Iranian children killed on the battlefield. And the reason they were killed on the battlefield because they were dispatched by the Ayatollahs of Iran with a necklace and a key on the necklace, a key to paradise. And they were dispatched to clear mines in minefields. And the promise was, Anyone who is killed during that so-called holy mission will find himself right away in paradise with some 70 virgins uh, there. This is the nature of the beast. This is the nature of the leopard, whether it is a leopard in Iran or a leopard in uh, Gaza. And what uh, challenges the West is to realize that leopards many times do change tactics, but they cannot and they don't intend to change spots. And as long as the West will not realize that leopards do not change spots, the, the West will keep on making mistakes after mistakes, pandering to terrorists in the Middle East and pressuring those who fight terrorists. For instance, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And no one should kid himself. Neither the Saudis nor the Egyptians respect human rights and democracy the way we do uh, in the West. But let's face it, the Saudis and the Egyptians, first of all, are pro-Americans. The Saudis and the Egyptians face daily existential threat by Muslim terrorists the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, ISIS, uh, and other terror uh, group. And here comes the US currently pressuring Egypt and Saudi Arabia to respect human rights and democracy by allowing more leeway to the Muslim bro Brotherhood terrorists in both uh, countries. But at the same time, I haven't detected US pressure on the Ayatollahs of Iran to desist from repression in Iran. And mind you, the repression in Iran is second to none in the Middle East. Violation of human rights in Egypt and Saudi Arabia pale 
compared to the repressive regime in Iran, not from yesterday, but from the first day they took control of Iran, namely in January of 1979. And last and not least, all this is evidenced in the Iranian and Hamas, and by the way, also Palestinian Authority school curriculum K through 12, when they teach hate and hatred and urging youngsters to become shahid, to become martyrs for the cause of Islam or conduct jihad, holy war on behalf of Islam against the so-called infidel Israelis, infidel Americans, basically infidel Western society, which they view as a target to subordinate. Well, Ambassador, I, I want to, I'm going to close the Gaza Strip search, uh, situation or war um, by just giving some folks some background. I do want to then have us move to talk about, because you mentioned, uh, and Mahmoud Abbas, who's the head now of the PLO, just want people to understand and this, there's some entities that I just wanted you to quickly explain, but just for people's uh, knowledge base, the Gaza, Gaza Strip is a self-governing Palestinian territory. In 2017, the population was 590,000 plus or minus. In 1993, it was transferred to the Palestinian National Authority, which at that time was both Fatah and Hamas. And in 2006, Hamas is totally taken over into the present time is the ruling authority in the Gaza Strip. What is, does the Palestinian National Authority still exist or do we have under Mahmoud, there was something that was called the Palestinian Unity Government, which was Fatah and Hamas, which I believe extends beyond that into the West Bank, et cetera. Could you just explain that or clarify that for me? Sure. Uh, you, you have basically two Palestinians entity. Uh, one in uh, parts in parts of the West Bank, Judea and uh, Samaria, roughly 40, 50 percent of uh, that uh, area uh, controlled by the Palestinian Authority, uh, ruled by the PLO and Fatah, headed by Mahmoud Abbas, who succeeded Arafat. The other one is Hamas which controls uh, Gaza, as you said, they were under the same government until 2006, but then uh, there was a breakup into two separate units uh, fighting each other, as by the way befits every single Arab Muslim entity in the Middle East, where the domestic fightings many times exceeds in ferocity the fightings uh, in the region. When it comes to uh, uh, Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, it sheds light on a cardinal rule which uh, has characterized the Palestinians. Namely, the more authority one accords the Palestinian, the worse off or the more intense is the level of uh, terrorism. And it doesn't only afflict the Jewish state. You go back to the 1950s, a uh, major Palestinian element was involved with a Muslim Brotherhood terrorist in uh, Egypt. Uh, that time, the president of uh, Egypt allowed the Palestinians to operate almost freely in uh, Cairo. This resulted in anti-Egyptian terrorism by the Muslim Brotherhood, assisted by the Palestinians, then headed by Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and their cohorts. As a result, the Palestinian leaders had to flee uh, Egypt because of their on anti-Egyptian terrorism. Syria opened its arms and invited them to come to Syria. But by 1966, they felt strong enough in Syria and they expanded their terrorist activity beyond hitting Israeli targets from Syria into hitting targets inside uh, Syria, which 
obviously resulted in retaliation by Syria, which expelled them from Syria, and they ran away to Jordan. In 1968, the king of Jordan at that time, the late King Hussein, allowed the Palestinians to employ Jordan as the major platform of anti-Israeli terrorism. Some 250 Israelis were murdered by Palestinian terrorists between 1968 and 1970. But by September 1970, the Palestinians inside Jordan felt strong enough to attempt and topple their host regime, as again befits their conduct all along. As a result, a civil war ensued and the Palestinians were expelled, their leadership, Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and the rest of them were expelled from uh, Jordan into Lebanon. Between 70 and 1975, the Palestinians in southern Lebanon plundered southern Lebanon, took control of southern Lebanon as a base to terrorize uh, Israel south of uh, Lebanon. And by 75, they felt strong enough to attempt and take over the central regime in Beirut. Again, just like they did in Jordan, in Syria, and in uh, Egypt. That triggered, by the way, the Christians of Lebanon inviting the Syrians to come to their help against the PLO, which started major Syrian occupation of Lebanon and also series of civil wars in uh, Jordan. Well, uh, that Ambassador, you are such a wealth of knowledge. I would probably want to do an entire program just tracing that history. But there are some, we, we only have about, about uh, 15 minutes at the most. Uh, maybe slightly less than that. There are three areas that I would like to have covered. Uh, I, I, as I said, I do my research. So I read an article that you wrote in November of last year in the Beth Tefla, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, Family Bulletin, Second Thought, a U.S. Israel, Israel Initiative. And in that, you were talking about the U.S. Israeli relations as related to Secretary Antony Blinken and what's being proposed now. And I'm gonna read just some of them. So I wanna cover that and I'll read that in a moment. I, I can't leave this program without talking about the change in the prime minister because even the person who is doing the negotiations on behalf of Israel with, uh, with Abbas was the person Bennett who is now the prime minister and talk briefly about that. Um, but, um, and I had one other uh, point, oh yes, if you want to contrast the um, Trump administration to the Biden administration with regards to its Israeli policy. So let me just list for folks some of the things you wrote about as far as under Anthony Blinken, the current U.S. Secretary of State. He opposes Israel's annexation and presence in Judea and Samaria, and that they should not go beyond the 1949 ceasefire lines. Israeli land concessions as a prerequisite to peace, creating a Palestinian state in Gaza, Judea, Samaria, and East Jerusalem. Support still supports aid to Jerusalem, to excuse me, to Israel as the United States has done for ever. Um, to annual financial aid to the Palestinian Authority, I need annual financial aid to an organization. I didn't have a chance to check out what the acronyms meant, UNRWA, and I'm sure you know what that is and can respond to that. And then the reopening of the PLO office in Washington, DC. Your article suggests you don't agree with most of that. What say you? Okay, uh, once again, uh, I do not doubt. And in fact, I recognize the fact that uh, the intentions by Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken are very, very noble and very, very positive. I have a problem with a gap between uh, the intentions on the one hand and Middle East reality on the other hand. Uh, there was a major, major, in my mind, the number one historian of the Middle East, the late Professor Eli Kaduri from uh, London University, 
School of Oriental uh, Studies, and he claims that for Westerners to assume that they can force the Middle East into uh, digesting Western institutions and Western values such as peace and democracy and human rights is like an attempt to force uh, water to run from the sea to the mountain uh, top. I wish it would be possible. I have my doubts. And for instance, uh, example to the unrealistic uh, attitudes by Secretary uh, Blinken uh, is the renewal of annual foreign aid to the Palestinian Authority. It was suspended by the Trump administration for one reason. The Trump administration stated that no foreign aid would be extended to the Palestinian Authority as long as they provide monthly allowances to families of terrorism, of terrorists, as long as they uh, accord much le legitimacy and herald uh, Palestinian terrorists, and as long as they conduct hate education. Namely, it was suspended for a reason, and the aim was to moderate the Palestinian Authority to make it more amenable to peace with Israel. The current administration has renewed foreign aid to the Palestinians without preconditioning, an end to hate education, an end to monthly allowances to families of terrorists, and an end to engagement in, uh, in uh, terrorism. The same also applies to the UN Relief and Work Agency, UNRWA. Now the title is very, very positive, but this agency, which was supposed to back in 1950 to uh, try and end the status of Palestinian refugees, made, has made its utmost to perpetuate Palestinian refugee uh, status. The Trump administration stated very clearly that annual foreign aid to UNRWA is going to be suspended as long as UNRWA perpetuates uh, refugee status rather than solve refugee status. And as long as UNRWA funds hate education by Palestinians. The current administration renewed uh, this foreign aid to UNRWA without preconditioning a change, a positive change in the attitude by, uh, by UNRWA. Such an attitude in my mind intensifies terrorism, again, against the intention of the administration, but the reality is such that Palestinians, just like the Ayatollahs of Iran, do not leverage financial aid, economic assistance, diplomatic gesture to moderate policy, they leverage it to intensify uh, terrorism, which destabilizes the Middle East and also undermines major American economic and national security interests in the Middle East and beyond. Well, Ambassador, I, I, you know, I sit here in awe of, of, of you in terms of your command of all of this, your sensitivity and how you handle particularly that contrast. And I, I, I certainly don't want this to be the last time in 2021 that you and I have a chance to have a conversation because it's much more. I would want to talk about Afghanistan. I mean, I just think it's so important and things change so dramatically in some of these relationships, what's going on in terms of with you up. Europe, uh, the G7 and its impact. And so there's a lot of pieces of that we can discuss, but I want to end in the last five minutes here. I can't not leave this without talking about the 13th prime minister of uh, Israel, uh, Naftali uh, Bennett. He's been uh, the prime minister since June of, uh, of, the, of this year. He was the former minister of the diaspora affairs, the former minister of education, and most recently, the, the Minister of Defense from 2019 to 2020. His party is called Yamina, and there's been a lot of different changes there as far as who's in and who's out. 
He had previously had the Jewish home and and um, um, and the Zionist party in it. Uh, now it's only the new right now. I've done some things in terms of trying to understand the parliamentary procedure in uh, in Israel. Uh, now he will serve for a period of time and then Yair Lapid would serve another portion of time as the prime minister. This changes from uh, former prime minister Netanyahu's Likud party and everything. Just very quickly, what bodes well in the, or what bodes for Israel politically with these types of changes? We have about four minutes and so I'll leave that with you. But before, because I know you and I will get to talking, I just want to thank my producer, Roy Cohen. I want to thank the new station manager, Mark Lindy, uh, Robert Rotella, who works with Roy on, on, on uh, editing if we need any, and David Young. So I want to thank them. And I'm going to end with you, Ambassador, talking about this issue, because I know that we will go on and on. And I, if I go over, Roy will definitely... Uh, uh, cancel me on the next show. So I want to be complicit with his desires. Well, first and foremost, uh, the new prime minister is as committed to enhanced U.S.-Israel relations as uh, was Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. And in fact, as uh, were all pr uh, previous prime ministers uh, in Israel, whether you're left or right, uh, hawk or dove, uh, secular or religious, you uh, are very, very much aware that the U.S. is the best, the most effective, the most reliable um, uh, ally of, uh, of Israel. And therefore, uh, I expect continued cooperation, uh, continued enhancement of uh, the, the cooperation. Uh, the prime minister uh, was uh, a very, very successful uh, high-tech uh, person, uh, entrepreneur before joining uh, politics. And therefore I expect him to accord much uh, focus or much uh, emphasis to expanded high-tech sector in Israel, which bodes well for the US also because of the US-Israeli cooperation in the area of commercial and defense uh, high tech. Uh, the prime minister uh, uh, has been involved, has been involved, as you suggested, in uh, education, in uh, defense. He is very, very uh, much uh, involved in regional, in global uh, issues. When it comes to the US, his uh, parents uh, lived for a long time in the U.S. He himself spent few years of his youth in the U.S. So you're talking about very much U.S.-oriented prime minister in a similar way that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was also extremely uh, U.S.-oriented. Or, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the one element that could uh, cause some tensions between U.S. and Israel. As I mentioned before, there are tensions within uh, families, there are tensions within uh, friends. And what are friends for, if not to voice uh, contradictory views and settle the, the difference? The, the, the conflict which I can foresee in the short run, in the immediate run between the Biden administration in the U.S., and the Bennett administration in Israel uh, has to do with uh, Iran. Uh, when it comes to Iran, uh, the current prime minister shares uh, exactly the worldview of Prime Minister Netanyahu, namely adhering to realism and not allowing, not allowing our wishful thinking to subordinate uh, realism. And this is a case of uh, conflicting uh, views, conflicted assessments between uh, the Biden administration and the Bennett uh, administration. Uh, I, I'm confident that they will engage in such, such uh, discussions. Hopefully, hopefully the prime minister who is pretty eloquent and pretty uh, good at uh, human uh, rapport will be able 
to present effectively Middle East reality to Secretary of State Blinken, to the National Security Advisor Jake uh, Sullivan, to CIA Director uh, William Burns, and uh, document to his American colleagues that as much as we wish it, the Ayatollahs of Iran are not about to abandon their fanatic uh, vision, their uh, uh, imperialistic vision, which goes beyond the Persian Gulf, beyond the Middle East, beyond Central Asia, beyond Africa. It goes throughout the entire world. And the aim is, again, to subordinate the so-called infidel uh, to Islam. And the number one target has never been Israel. Israel is referred by the Ayatollahs as the little Satan. As you uh, know and the viewers know, the big Satan, as far as the Ayatollahs of Iran, has always been the USA. And when they fight Israel, they realize they fight the most trusted ally of the US in the Middle East, which well, makes Ambassador Israel word I know you and I, as I said, that's why I wanted to leave the time, but we're, we're, we have run out of time. And I always, I want to thank you. I hope this is not the last opportunity we'll have to have you on. It is always enlightening. I enjoy reading the Ettinger reports and I encourage our viewing audience to, uh, to go online and to read the Ettinger reports. They're very informative. That's where I get my information to be in preparation to have this conversation with you. It is always uh, informative. Uh, and um, and and rewarding to have this time with you. I want to bid you well as we depart today. Uh, best to uh, to your wife Aura, and I trust that we'll have an opportunity to speak again because there's much of the topics I like to cover. So have a great day. Thank you, and it's been my pleasure and my honor. Thank you.